So there have been loads of experts when it comes to the carp cycling, but I've got a real one. Justin Harris, nice to meet you again, and nice to speak to you again. Yeah, glad to, glad to be here. You look you look like you've added some size since I was last year. Yeah, um, like uh, 10 kilograms more uh, yeah, heavier. Was, so yeah, yeah. how are you doing? I'm good. I'm very good. Yeah, before we go to the main subjects, I want to ask you about your thoughts about the Olympia. We had many, many of uh, great showings and few not so. Are there any disappointments that you have noticed? Well, I mean, I think Big Big Rami was, you know, a disappointment, but I don't think it was as bad as people make it out to be. You know, it's like one of those things where, you know, he... He wasn't like out of the mix. He was, you know, he was kind of in the mix dur during the show, but then clearly he wasn't as good as he was before. And then it kind of snowballs on social media. And now everyone's acting like, you know, he just completely fell off the map. I mean, you, there's, there's, it's, there's actually a video, I think maybe Dennis James posted, I think either the morning of or the day before. He's like, he, I think he's got a shirt on or something. He's doing like a side chest and you can see his legs. And that's the thing is you can see how close he was. I mean, if if that's all you saw, and that's all we shot, saw leading up to Olympia the day before, people would have been saying, "Oh, it's his game over. He's he's winning." You know, so it wasn't like he was it was a disaster or anything. Uh, uh, but Derek Derek Lundsfeld, I I really wished I was hoping on some podcast someone would ask my predictions because he was my dark horse the whole way when he when he guest posed earlier in the year. I was at the Pittsburgh, I think, with uh, and was standing next to Nick Walker. And he looked like he was possibly in better condition than Nick at the time and holding every bit as much size as Nick. And so he was he was my uh, dark horse. And I think he could have won. I think he was uh, a little too much in both directions. I think, he, you know, he's very full. But I think he was a little too filled out and then tried to dehydrate a little bit too much. It, you kind of get this weird look uh, when uh, when you're a little over dehydrated. It almost looks like spilling over, but because you can imagine, like you know, what is hydration? Blood or water in the body? Where is water in the body? You know, in the blood. And so, when you're properly hydrated, all the little microvascular microvasculature, all the little veins right next to the surface of the skin are filled up, and that's what actually creates that grainy look, like what Branch Warren would have or something. Derek didn't have any of that because his blood volume was too low. Because I think he dried out a little too much, so his muscles were a little smoother than they could have been, even though they still were pretty full. But man, I'm pumped for him. I think he's a future Mr. Olympia, absolutely. And I think Nick Walker did better than I expected also. I mean, it's hard to even say that anymore because, you know, he just keeps getting better and better. You know, it's like you, you need to stop being surprised by it. You know, and he improved his waistline. Uh, I mean, he's got some issues that I think are going to – I think Derek's better structurally, you know, and so that's going to be tough. But I, I hope that turns into a good battle – year after year like we used to have with you know uh ronnie and uh cutler or we had with dorian and sean ray or you know like that kind of like neck and neck because that's what makes it fun and they're both pretty young i think derek's a little older but they're you know i hope that turns into a good uh good showing but it looks like the changing of the guard you know i mean the the previous group is kind of on its way out you know rami's you know clearly on the way out you know ruley's out completely uh 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 Oh my God. William Bonac, uh, yeah. So it looks like definitely a transition year, and I think it's a first time I'm a, I'm really excited about the new crop of people in a while. Yeah, you know the Samson and Andrew as well. We can't forget yeah, about yeah, man, yeah, 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 yeah. All guys, Samson, yeah, and Andrew Jack, man, that that guy just standing there, he's like Paul Delette, but but uh, Paul Delette who can actually pose pretty well, but just standing there, he. Because when I first started hearing about him and everyone was saying, you know, the next big thing, and I go look some pictures of him hitting poses, I'm like, yeah, he looks good, but I'm not seeing it. But then when you watch a live stream and you see him in the transitions between poses or even just standing there, you see it, you're like, oh, wow, yeah, that guy's got something. I think he's got a, like, I think he can, I think he poses small for his size a little bit. And, uh, 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 Nick Walker, I'm, I'm I'm getting over a cold, so sorry if my brain's down. <laughs> Nick Walker, the year before he turned pro, he was kind of doing that also. It's hard to explain, but pose small. Yeah, like Nick's this, for example. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nick's obviously massive, but if you look at the you look at his his pro qualifier the year before he did turn pro, and look at him on stage, he looks like one of the smaller super heavyweights in some of the poses. Where he's obviously not. He's you know he's a monster. He and he fixed that. And I think when Andrew Jack fixes that, 
uh, he he's like he can be Mr. Olympia for sure. And then man, Samson too. It's like we got like four guys that all have that because Samson's almost like a little Ronnie Coleman, you know. Like you see that potential because I mean, who knows where he's going to go? Because go find pics of him two or three years ago. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's changing fast. So that's yeah, it's gonna it's a first time the sport's been very exciting for a while. The only thing that's kind of bothering me about the pro at the IFBB world right now is they keep the, with the Olympia so late in the year, no one's doing the Arnold now. You're going to ruin. I mean, it was a perfect setup. You had the Olympia and like, you know, it used to be like September and then they moved to October, but you know, you used to have the Olympia in the fall and the Arnold in the spring. And you'd have pretty much every big guy except Mr. Olympia would be in both those shows. We, so we had two big shows each year that you could get excited about, have all the hype. And now what there's eight competitors in the Arnold. Now and it's down to six, actually. Oh, man. And they canceled the Arnold Amateur for a minute. And then, because uh, yeah. I, had, I had people prepping for it, they canceled it. And then, of course, everyone goes out of prep, you know, because like, there's no other big shows that, you know, right around there. So it's like, okay, we got we to pull it back. We'll do, you know, Nationals or North Americans or something in the in the, in the uh, fall or in the later in the summer. And then they put it back on. And it's like, well, great. Now we're nine weeks out. <laughs> you know, we haven't been dieting for two weeks. But it'll be... Yeah, that's a yeah i don't know what's going on with that i'm a little i i i'm 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 kind of starting to wonder i I would bet in five years the arnold fitness weekend will be a very different event and it will be just a fitness weekend it'll be it'll be girls you know gymnastics competitions cheerleading competitions grappling stuff amateur uh olympic olympic lifting stuff and i think bodybuilding will kind of phase out i hope it doesn't happen but it sure seems like that's the path it's going you know, where where the money falls. And as you said, if the show is so close, there is no way that those people can, like Samson, for example, Oh, it's, it's, huge props for him. He was dieting for a whole year, basically, and he still competes. That's a Milos school yeah. because, you know, Milos used to, like be an, in every in show. Yeah. <laughs> so, But that, I mean, that's tricky. If, if everyone remembers David Durth, he competed, I think, in every single show one year uh just to, i think to see if he could do it but he was always kind of in shape and but i think he pretty much that he i think he even went on record in one of the magazines saying that kind of ended his career his body was just so ruined from being in contest shape for a year straight so it's hard for those guys and it's not you know if the arnold was like two or four weeks after the olympia or maybe even six weeks it's like okay they can hold it together but you got you know what, eight or ten weeks i mean it, you know it's even or even more you can't you know, you can't hold that. And it's not enough time to take a break. You can't take eight weeks off and then prep again for six weeks or four weeks because it just doesn't work that way. And so, yeah, it's just unfortunate. Six competitors now, it's, it's too bad. Yeah, the classic is to, uh, to kind of... But it's still, you know, it's not a bodybuilding. It's not a show that we are uh, waiting for. And it's been the main event there, but it's becoming like a second one now. Yeah, it, well, for years, for for... I mean, for 10 or 15 years, it was, okay, Mr. Olympia only does the Mr. Olympia. Then the Arnold comes and we, and we see who's the favorite to try to beat the Mr. Olympia. You know, Flex, like Flex uh, Wheeler in 93, you know, it's like, wow, he's going to, because, you know, Dorian won in 92 and then Flex comes with the Arnold in 93, just looking amazing. And so everyone's like, well, you know, he's going to beat Dorian. But then that's the year Dorian made his huge change, you know, and it, like that stuff used to be really exciting or or Nasser, like in 97, 96 or 97, Nasser would come to the Arnold and he's just a monster. And everyone's like, well, I think he can outsize Dorian. And then, of course, you know, the 96 and 97 Olympia, he he kind of did outsize him, but he just, you know, he ended up losing because of his back, basically. But you just, you lose all that. And now we just wait a whole year not knowing how anyone looks, not having any hype, not having any big names to get excited about. So, I, I mean, it is what it is. Firstly, a question not being related to a carb cycling, but been a coach for so many years you have been coaching for how much how long time close to 20 yeah i mean geez it's yeah it is 20 years almost gee it might be 21 now yeah how to stay motivated and driven in this doing the same things basically over and over again it's difficult it can be difficult you see it's it's uh i mean i've answered emails all day every day seven days a week for half of my life and so there's so many the the so many things that it's i remember uh because you know i went back to school for physics and there's a there's a famous physicist uh landau from uh, russia who wrote this uh really uh really well renowned classical mechanics book at the graduate level 
and which is it you know it's like it's like 100 pages where most classical mechanic pages books are like a thousand pages he was just so succinct and precise and he was brilliant with that and i remember a comment he said is he said he can't remember a time when he didn't know how to take a derivative of a function you know like calculus you know because he really his whole life and to me it's kind of like because i can't remember a time where i didn't nutrition wasn't just all i did all day so you know it's obviously it's going to be you know when you because you, you say the same thing every single day for 20 years it's it can be difficult to get to be motivated but what i a weird thing is because i work with a wide mix of people i don't have well, a lot of coaches have restrictions you know they only want to work with top people which to me i think is almost i mean not don't not it's just not as enjoyable you know because what you'll see all the time is you'll see a coach take someone who no one knows who they are and they'll have like two or three years and they blow up. And then now they look like they're going to turn pro. And what happens that that guy goes and joins another coach and, you know, he turns pro. He was going to turn pro anyway, either way, you know, his trajectory was going like this, you know, but some people have that criteria where that's all they'll take and they'll work with them and they don't really improve. All they're doing with those people are, you know, dialing in their peak or trying to refine things, you know, and that's fun. And that's, you know, like, like someone like a Chad Nichols, who's you're like known for that. That That's great. But for me, you know, like, uh, I love taking people like that no one's ever heard of, you know, like, uh, David Lamartine, I just posted pictures on my Instagram, you know, you know, gaining 100 pounds, or, you know, Nathan Mead doing roughly the same thing, Ben Pollock gaining 81 pounds in one year, uh, 81 uh, pounds. Well, <laughs> what the this is this is a this is an all time world record holding power lifter who walked around at about 230 and would very nearly kill himself to make 181 or 198. And so he did a classic competition at 181 pounds. So he was artificially dieted down excessively, you know, but you can see the pictures if you scroll far enough back through my Instagram. Uh, but he, and so, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, there's David, you know, and so, you know, like if I was a coach, like a lot of other coaches, I would never have accepted him in the before photo there. You know, there's a young Steve Kuklo uh, and a young me. <laughs> But, uh, you know, like that, that, that picture of David above a mm -hmm. normal coach wouldn't have taken him on, you know, you know, and so now he's, you know, he's, he's, he's 295 pounds, you know, so he's a, he's a legit solid, super heavyweight competitor. You know, he's got some structural things he needs to work on some, cause he's a former power lifter. So he's still got a power lifting build, but that stuff, yeah, he's got to fill out his lats. I mean, he's, and he's got that thickness that a power lifter has. Yeah, that, like glute, that kind that, of stuff. That's his glutes are like overpowering his uh, oh, hamstrings. He's like, yeah, carrying a trailer behind him. Yeah, <laughs> it's like he's got a, <laughs> he needs to get a CDL for that thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, but it looks good, you know, because most of people have problems with developing their glutes. Yeah, so his glutes and hamstrings are really so. The, the things he needs to bring up are what powerlifters need to bring up. But the good thing is the things that he doesn't need to bring up are the, are typically the hard things to grow, which are like hamstrings. You know, we just, but you know, he's got, you know, he's probably got 10 years of training under his belt and he's only got two years doing anything for lats, you know, and you can see they have, you know, there has been a lot, obviously a lot of size increase, but stuff like that's what I, what I enjoy. So I work with a lot, a wide mix of people and I, I still have uh quite a, cause I, my, my first job as a nutritionist was a nutritionist for a cardiology office in, in the Detroit area. And so through word of mouth or, you know, 20 years later, people still record, you know, that I helped there, I still have probably, I don't even know, 10% maybe of my clients are still people with, you know, cardiac issues, people on pacemakers, people on beta blockers that are trying to, you know, not, not gain body fat, some IBS patients, Crohn's, Candida, SIBO, things like that. And so I do get enough of a mix where it keeps it slightly more interesting, you know, but man, it's it, coach. It's a tough, it, well, I'll get on a rant. It's a, it's a harder gig than people think. Cause if you, if you care about it, you know, yeah. because you know, and I do, you know, and that's why I've been doing it for so long. You know, like I love this, I love the sport of bodybuilding and I really care how my, my clients do. And there's, you do in any competition, only one person walks away happy. That's it. The winner, exactly. you know? And so like, it's tough as a coach because you might have seven people competing, you know, and, and, and like at the state level, people pay me to win. Like if you're competing at a novice show or a state competition, you know, not at the national level, you should win if you hire a good coach, you know, and, and typically it's rare, you know, my guys are always, you know, we're always in the mix and we usually win and that's what you expect. And so you get some joy in that, but if you have, you know, people, some people competing at nationals and it's the biggest day of their life, you know, 
and maybe one wins and you're excited for them, but six of them, it's the worst day of their life. You know, they, they just put all their heart and soul into the competition and then they lose, and, you know, and it's like, you know, that hurts as a coach. Cause you feel not, I mean, it's not as bad as when it's actually you, but it's pretty darn close. And that's the hard thing about coaching is it's like, it's just never ending, like feeling bad, you know, like, Oh, just, it's, and f- with those rare, yeah, we did it. You know, like, uh, a client of mine, Renee, Renee Nasser, uh, formerly Renee Re- Riefschlager, she, uh, she was, uh, when we started working together, she was fairly overweight. She had already lost some weight, but she was enough overweight where she had to get uh, skin removal therapy, uh, two different versions of treatment, uh, you know, cold, cold uh, therapy, and then, then full skin removal surgery. And in, as I can't remember her exact age when she turned pro, but I believe she was 50, Uh, And she turned pro as a women's physique competitor and then now has placed top five in a IFBB pro show as a women's physique competitor. And so to me like that, you know, you know, that that's an amazing transformation. And all these coaches, none of those coaches would agree to take on a 50 year old, 200 pound housewife, which is, you know, you know, a a 200 pound woman at age 50 you know, and, and, and those are like the things, you know, like, cause that's like three years of exciting progress, you know? So that's, yeah. So anyone listening, if you think like, you don't have their credentials, all I care is that you work hard, you know, and I, it's way, or it's way more like a Dominic Trevlin. started working with me after the team nationals and he, he, you know, he's turned pro now. And I think he's with Jansen. I can't remember if he's still with him, but it, Dom, Dom is with Jansen, I think. Yeah. 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 I think he might've tried to go to Compton for a minute, but yeah, yeah. You know, amazing potential, but he was 176 pounds when we started working together as a middleweight. The next year he's a light heavyweight. Uh, and then he moved up to heavyweight, you know? And so like moving up a person up a weight class year after year after year, that's the fun part. Of course he got, you know, he took like top five. He was on the cusp of turning pro. And then, you know, then he went with another coach there. He finds some things and he deserved, he should have turned pro the year before he turned pro. Actually, he was in incredible shape that year, but, uh, yeah, so th- those are the things that are really fun. And that's the part that doesn't get boring. And what if not everyone can afford your services? There is an ebook you said. And uh, yep. could you elaborate a little ab- yep. about it? Well, I have two options. I don't, I want to recommend my nutritionist, Thomas, Thomas Lackey. He's got, he's been with me for five years. He's got his master's in nutritional science. He's published one of our ebooks, is entirely written by him. Uh, he writes for Team Tripona and he's, he's published research papers in nutritional science very very good nutritionist who's about half the price of mine uh but then also my ebooks so the this a lot of work went into these obviously massive and shredded that right there at the top they're full uh diet programs this that with an algorithm where you enter your height uh weight uh and your estimated body fat and it outputs a full diet it outputs a whole diet with macros for every meal macro, you know, different macros for pre-workout, post-workout, intra-workout. And then it also shows a full meal plan of, of, of food that hits those macros exactly. And then it gives separate pages additionally, where it gives you a list of like eight or nine foods for each macro that will also, so, you know, if it's like, if, if, if it says you need 162 grams of chicken in this meal and you don't want 162 grams, you don't want to eat chicken. It says, or you could also have 173 grams of turkey breast or 192 grams of 96, four ground beef. And it, and it complete outputs a complete custom diet and it, it up updates also. So as your, as your body composition changes, so you can keep entering your weight and estimated body fat. And every time you enter it, it'll output a whole new diet. If you need a new diet, if you haven't changed, you know, if you've only lost one pound of body fat and you, you change your, your weight on there, you know, by one pound, the algorithm is going to see that and say, you don't need a new diet yet. You need to lose more weight. But then you say you lose five pounds of fat. You put those numbers in, it'll readjust the whole diet. So, so basically, those. basically, we should only change the weight when we stagnate. Well, you should you just you can you could do what I recommend every week or whatever. You, like have a set time, you know, take photos, weigh in, and look at the pictures. And tr- the only hard part is that I'm asking you to estimate your body fat percentage, and so that's my calculations are based around the what typically what skin calipers will typically measure. So if you do like a hydrostatic or an in-body scan and it gives a different number and you trust that, the numbers might be off a little bit. But mine are basically that once you're 12% body fat, you'll have an outline of all your abs. At 10% are pretty good. You know, at 6%, you're shredded, basically. That's what my algorithm works on. But you enter that. So, you know, like for me, say I'm 270 pounds at 15% body fat 
you know, and I weigh in next week and I'm 272 pounds and I think I've dropped a percent of body fat. So I put 14, it would take those numbers and it would, I would be pretty confident, pretty sure it would output a whole new diet. It is hard to find a question uh, to ask you because there there has been so many podcasts about the carb cycling because I don't I don't want to repeat those but yeah, yeah. I have found few that might sound interesting and be helpful to some people and first one is best protein carbs and fat fat sources when it comes to the carb cycling. This is a hard one because I mean there, it's dependent on the timing you know there's certain times where you might want a slower digesting protein or faster digesting protein or things like that but the honest to god truth is bodybuilding is meat and rice that's it we have a shirt at first attachment that says steak rice repeat you know because that that's it and you know when i when i was growing up we had the magazines we didn't know all you got was what they fed you in the magazines which is just whatever they made up but you can go on youtube now and what do you see if you see you watch uh, keep going on i keep talking about nick walker nick walker a year or two ago they had a birthday party for him and it's the middle of the off season and they have a birthday party at some restaurant and everyone's there ordering restaurant food you know and so nick walker you know 36 weeks out of a competition what does he do on his birthday walks in with a big tub of chicken and rice and it, it, you know and that's so if, well, for me, if I were to say the best protein source as far as an amino acid profile that's probably most close to the, us as humans, I would say red meat. But it, you know, it has to be lean red meat. That's the hard part. In general, for just so you don't have to worry about it, you know, like because I like to the fats I like to include, I like to include them as added fat so I can choose what type of fat they are, how much omega-3 fatty acids or whatever there are. So chicken would be your safest bet. I don't like protein powder very much. It's, it's sometimes you just have to, you can't get a meal in. It just digests so fast. And I can, I can explain why I, keep, I don't want to keep using Nick Walker, but this is another good example. He's gained 120 pounds in 10 years, you know, yes. 120 pounds. It's enormous, you know, 120 pounds of stage weight, but that's only 12 pounds a year or uh, one pound a month. And if you take one pound, you know, which is about 500 grams and divide it by 30 days, you see that you, He's only gaining about 25 grams of protein per day. So of all that protein he ate, each day, only about 25 grams of it ever did anything as far as building muscle. Well, so think about it. There's 24 hours in a day. So you basically get one gram per hour. That's it. That's what you get. And if you're perfect every day, you can keep stringing along that one gram per hour and one gram over 24 hours for, you know, for, for 12 years or 10 years is 120 pounds. But now let's look at a whey protein isolate it digests really quickly, say an hour and a half, right? Now, let's say you have it after your workout and you take a 50 grams. So you eat 50 grams and an hour and a half later, that's gone. How much muscle could you build in that hour and a half? One and a half grams, basically. So 48 and a half grams of that way, what happens to that? Well, it's not used for protein. It gets goes through gluconeogenesis, gets converted into a carbohydrate. And basically all you did was take a crappy form of a carbohydrate. Where if you take a steak, you know, and, and I've, I've used this analogy before, but almost everyone has got sick at some point and puked and there's chunks of steak and you're like, Jesus Christ, when did I eat steak? Was that two days ago? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And Cause it digests so slowly. So when you eat these whole food protein sources, you know, that any, cause you don't know when the body's going to synthesize muscle, you know, you got this cell and then boom, there's a trigger. mTOR is triggered. This cell says, I need to, I need to add more proteins onto the cell to make it bigger. Well, what, so it needs all the essential amino acids floating by it in the bloodstream right at that moment. If you don't have those amino acids at that moment, because you, because it's been two hours, three hours since you drank your whey shake and you got, you can't, you don't build muscle then. Where if you eat the slow protein, there's, that's always there. And then for carbs, my favorite is typically rice uh, because it's, you know, try, try to eat 20 ounces of potato. That's a lot of potato, you know, two cups of rice. You can shovel that down, you know, you know, pretty quickly. Uh, you know, and then, you know, what is that? Over, like two cups of oats also for that same amount of carbs. You know, that's a, you know, that's a massive amount of food. So when trying to grow rice is really easy. It's very low, very hypoallergenic. There's very few rice allergies. I think in 20 some years of coaching, I've had one client with a, with a, what appeared to be a clear rice allergy. That's it out of every, so you're very safe because that's a, that's a problem. Uh, and in general, in America, it seems like we're developing food allergies at, a, at an accelerated rate. But the problem with that is if you develop something like SIBO or Candida, SIBO is like small intestine, intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you're not going to be able to dry out. And you're not going to fill out before peak because if you're carving up and you have SIBO, 
that's messing all that up. So while you're trying to fill out, you're getting watery as hell. And then you can't, you, you can't dry back out. So you really, it really is important to find, you know, like a, a, a hypoallergenic carb source is your primary source, you know, or if you, if you get gluten and uh, I have celiac disease, so I, I can't eat the gluten. <laughs> it's my punishment for making fun of that for 20 years. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but I think, I, I think I gave it to myself essentially. I mean, I have autoimmune issues in general, and so that's kind of an autoimmune response. My body attacks that that protein. And I think because for for a decade as a bodybuilder, I didn't eat bread hardly ever. The only time I did would be like after a contest or a cheat meal. And I got sick every time I ate that, you know. So, yeah. So it just and then for fats, uh, I'm I'm more I, personally for taste. I like like avocado guacamole. It's, it's a healthy it's a it's a good mix of healthy fats. It makes I because I, I can eat anything if there's guacamole on it. You know, it's not my favorite taste in the world. But you give me like, like chicken and broccoli and mash it all up. It's not very, it's not my favorite. <laughs> but if you put some guacamole in it, it's got something I can at least shovel it down with, you know. Uh, and then I, I really, I, it's in my food list, but I don't like using the nut butters like peanut butter or almond butter. I mean, there's, they're great sources, but the problem is they're hard to count macro wise because there's, you know, they're like for one tablespoon, there will be about seven grams of protein or fat, but there's about seven grams of protein also. That's not negligible. You know, that's some calories in there. And then there's carbs also that like some like uh, artificial sources will be like 12 grams of carb per serving, you know, so it's hard to call that a fat source. And no one on in the history of earth in a diet has ever measured a tablespoon of peanut butter correctly <laughs> it's <No>. impossible <laughs> yeah so a tablespoon turns into you know like an ice cream scoop <laughs> so yeah so that's my only thing with the with the nut butters is they're just too and and there's nothing that tastes better when you're dieting than peanut butter you know i i'm i'm 600 weeks out of a contest <laughs> right now you know there's peanut butter in the cupboard i'll look at and doesn't phase me i, I haven't i haven't ate peanut butter in two years you get me three weeks into a diet and I'll start dreaming about peanut butter. <laughs> but when it comes where you, when your calories get really high, do you have like some kind of dirty food choices? Like, um, for example, rice flakes or something like this? Yep. Yep. And my, we, 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 my, my high carb days are very high. Typically, we really yep. try to push carbohydrates. On those days, I do 50% of the carbs at each meal will come from sugary sources. And all I care is that they're low fat or close to zero fat. So theoretically, you could eat Twizzlers and Skittles. Uh, the only thing that, I, and I've noticed this, and I've, I've, I haven't, I, for a long time, I didn't say it because I was trying to compile enough data, but I've got like a decade of pretty clear data that people who, for their sugary sources, use natural sources like fruit, uh, true fruit juice and juice uh, seem to do much better than the people who try to eat the candy. It seems like because the people who try to eat candy for the sugar, eventually that they're, they're it seems like they really struggle with appetite. They you know they get burned out and they're always complaining about like feeling feeling shitty or crappy on high days. And I think it's kind of you know an, inf an inflammation because carbs are pretty inflammatory to begin with. But it seems like the people who who eat fruit you know and especially the ones who eat like you know like uh, fruit that that are that can be good on digestion like papaya or. Uh, pineapple do great and they power through the high days they feel great on high days but when you're dieting and there's the option of eating skittles or not it, it, yeah it's a tough one to pass off <laughs> i'd rather eat a bag of rice than uh, have a skittle you know because the skittles are going to be like uh yeah oh yeah yeah that's the fist well, yeah. size yeah that's the problem 50 grams yeah because those little packets those are 50 grams that's one <laughs> Yeah, 50 grams gone and it's gone and <laughs> yeah. a cup of rice it's a lot uh yeah. how about what about cheat meals how do you incorporate them into the carb cycling i actually use them quite a bit and i will leave them in once a week the entire contest prep as long as a person is staying on track if if they're if they're not on track we'll either remove the cheat meal or i'll put a limit on it like say you no more than 1200 calories but i do them kind of in a weird way actually i have the cheat meal as the last meal of the day on the high carb day and you think, geez, that's terrible. You're going to store all that as fat. But there's there's a there's a reason for it. Exactly. I mean, you really won't. Yeah. I mean, it's not. I, like I mean, that. I know what you are uh, trying but to say. That most of people think like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, the, it's, my thing is, high day is already a storage day. We already know we're eating more calories than we burn. We're storing glycogen so that we can use that as fuel the rest of the week, where our calories are much much lower. So we already know that. So we're not stopping fat burning because we already knew this is a storage day for us. But then also by, by the last meal of the day, 
you've been, you might've eaten a thousand grams of carbs. You're full, you know? I mean, obviously in a diet, you'll still eat, but you're not going to eat as much. And, and also because it's the last meal of the day, you can't turn it into a cheat day because you have to go to sleep. Cause I just found too many times over the years when I would go for someone a cheat meal and I say, go ahead, go to, go to a breakfast place, get whatever you want. And then I get an, an email the next day, coach, I'm sorry. Uh, I ended up eating, da, 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 you know, and they just pick out the whole day. So for this, for me, it's a kind of a trick, I think, to kind of cheat the system in that you're giving them a cheat meal at the time of the week where they're the least hungry and they have the least amount of time to do it. Yeah, that's good. Good uh, thinking. Uh, when we come to the supplements, because you spoke about the whey protein and you said that mm -hmm. it's not a perfect one, that's interesting because you own yourself a mm -hmm. company, and not often I heard uh, JP, for example, said that if you can eat, then eat about mm -hmm. the protein sources. What about the supplements overall? that can help you while being on the carb cycling that's that's the that's the difference I'm, i'm glad you asked that and we didn't even script this so this is perfect there are times where liquid nutrients are are better there are and the most important is intra-workout you're not going to be eating chicken during your workout and also you don't even want whole protein during your workout because all you need is the essential amino acids you know and and uh, and the bcaas is specifically leucine is the trigger for protein synthesis but that's also an essential amino acid yeah and so So what you want is you, during the workout, you don't know if you're stimulating muscle growth. Say a cell right here says, boom, I want to add muscle. It needs all the essential amino acids right there or it can't do it. So what we do, and actually I got a bottle here, Field Rations, is a, it's a mix of uh, essential amino acids uh, with, a, uh, with a high amount of leucine combined with highly branched cyclodextrins uh, for the carbohydrate. But Uh, if, if you read into, you know, high molecular weight carbohydrates, but one of the problems is, is their, their osmolarity is so low. So to back, back way, the reason you don't want to drink like grape juice during a workout is because grape juice has a molecular weight and an osmolarity similar to blood. So that means there's no pull. If you remember osmosis, you know, there's no, no, no pull. So that stuff, that grape juice sits in your stomach. There's nothing to suck it into the small intestine really. So blood kind of pool. And sometimes there can even be a reverse gradient where, Water, water will come from the bloodstream and pool in the stomach and you get bloated. You know, if you ever drink a ton of the juice and you, like, your stomach's all bloated, it's not just from the juice, it's because other water's going in there too. And that water now can't go to your muscle and you feel like crap. Where a high molecular weight carbohydrate has a low osmolarity and what that does is it, it, instead of pooling water in the stomach, it basically is like a bowling ball right into the small intestine and that's where nutrients get absorbed. The problem is though, is then the water pools there in the intestines. And if it pools in the large intestine, you're going to get something called dumping syndrome, which is appropriately named because you're going to have to run to the bathroom and, and release your diarrhea. So what we do is we do a five to one ratio of highly branched cyclodextrins with dextrose to raise the osmolarity just enough to avoid dumping syndrome, but keep it low enough that you don't get any bloating. And then, and then the final thing is because we're trying to store glycogen because we want, we, you know, we want the amino acids essential amino acids to build muscle if anything happens, if there's a trigger for it. But we also want to get as much of a pump and drive nutrients to the muscle as good as we can. And to, so we want to store form glycogen. And so another problem you'll see with intra-workouts is they won't have any sodium. And so what glycogen is, is glycogen is carbs in the muscle, but it's one, for every one part of glucose, there's four parts water. So glycogen is made of one part glucose, four parts water, and then the carrier is sodium. And so if you don't have the sodium, you will can't carry it. And, and you can even track this. You take someone who's had too many diuretics and their blood sodium content is super low, their blood sugar skyrockets. That, and that's why you can't fill out. That's really what spilling over is more is that you can't, it's not that you had too many carbs, it's that you don't have the other nutrients to take those carbs to the muscle. They spill into the bloodstream and you look like crap. And so we have, a, we, we have a, added sea salt and, and other minerals also to make sure that all the components needed for glycogen storage are there. So, I mean, we're, really proud of it. We have a whole like research paper written comparing it to Gatorade and what the original research studies on Gatorade. I think just in general for, for any sport where you, you know, like where you're working hard for an hour or more, I think it's very valuable it, to get the message out, you know, is hard, you know, because it's like, you know, obviously Gatorade is, uh, I think Coke owns that Coca-Cola they're going to out advertise me, <laughs> you know, so you, it's hard to get the word out, but it's really, is, it really is a product we're proud of. That's why you need, uh, you know, to do more podcasts than, yeah. <laughs> than this one. Uh, when it comes to the supplements, I still want to ask about the GDAs, you know, the glucose disposal agents. Yeah. Do you use them? 
Oh yeah, yeah. Our, our product suppressor is uh, I've been using that for years. So I I always track data. I got like Google Drives full of just like noting what my clients say and whether. Uh, so from what my experience is, is pr properly used, fifteen hundred milligrams of berberine per day when it's good berberine and it's paired with something like cinnamon or piperine, black pepper extract, something to improve the bioavailability, 1500 milligrams of that per day appears to be about as effective at lowering blood sugar as a thousand milligrams of metformin, you know? And so you think that's great, but then you also think, well, why just take metformin then? Well, the problem with that is metformin works through cyclic AMP, which is in like an anti-inflammatory. It's an anti-hypertrophy pathway. So metformin actually slows the rate of muscle growth. Now, if you're on anabolics, it's probably not going to slow it enough to make much of a difference, but we don't want to slow it at all. Now, berberine works through a cascade reaction with IGF-1. So not, berberine works just as well in metformin, but rather than hold back muscle growth, it, it works through IGF-1 to promote muscle growth. So it's like the perfect product. You know, it's like, why wouldn't it, why would anyone not take this? You know, regardless of what you're doing, if I could raise my IGF-1 and improve my carb utilization and insulin sensitivity, that's a no brainer. You know, and then we have like the other things and we have fenugreek also and fenugreek seed actually can help. It's an interesting one because it lowers blood sugar also by like by stimulating insulin secretion. And actually you can theoretically go hypoglycemic just from fenugreek seed, almost as if you took insulin. Uh, and we, we use that on, on purpose because the IGF-1 is actually more insulinogenic on a milligram per milligram basis than actual insulin. So when we combine that with the fenugreek, it's a nice little added benefit. And of course, we have the cinnamon uh, in, uh, for, in the pep peppering for uh, increased bioavailability. And then we have uh, our ALA, which just is another standard product that's shown time and time again to be beneficial to the body composition, body fat levels, and improved glucose, you know, improved insulin sensitivity. When it comes to the insulin usage, uh, do you incorporate it in the off season or in a, or do both. you in a prep? Yeah, yeah, both. And I think people do it, and I think people get insulin so wrong, and it, and it drives me crazy that people get it wrong. And everyone does it. Here's what everyone does: everyone says, "Okay, I'm going to use insulin. I'm going to take ten IU's. How many carbs do I have to eat to not go hypo on ten IU's? What does it matter? You don't know. How, you, how do you know that amount of carbs is not going to make you fat? You don't know. So everyone says insulin makes you fat. Yeah, because you took a bunch and then you had to eat all this, all this sugar and carbs to not go hypo. Well, the way I use it is completely different. We build a diet. And so we have a high carb day and we know you're taking this high carb day. You've been using it. You're not getting fat. We know your body can utilize these nutrients at, on its own. Now we add a little bit of insulin to it and we add insulin up until the point just before you go hypo. You know, so as much as we can, now what we've done is we, we're not adding calories. So we know you're not going to get fat because we're not eating any more food. We're eating the same food. Only now we've optimized the nutrient uptake. And so what does insulin do? It increases glycogen storage, right? So some of those carbs that may potentially have been stored as fat before now will be stored as glycogen. What's that mean? Less fat storage. Some of those amino acids, what's the other thing that insulin does? When insulin binds to a cell, you know, you picture insulin receptor in a cell, it binds in. What this does is it shovels some proteins around and basically it opens up a drain so amino acids could flood into the cell. So it increases amino acid uptake. So now again, we're doing the same diet. We add the insulin to it. Now, rather than then that one gram of protein per hour, what if we can get 1.5? Now, you know, some of that protein that before couldn't be synthesized as muscle now has the chance to because of insulin. So when, when used that way, not only will it not make you fat, it'll improve your body composition. You know, now it's not dramatic. Like, it's not like after six weeks, you're going to look like a different person, but I can absolutely guarantee you if you use insulin properly in that manner, optimizing the diet rather than just taking insulin and then trying to eat as much as you can to not die, you will, after 10 years, you'll absolutely carry more muscle mass and carry less body fat. Even point one of the protein uh, synthesis, it's a lot when you consider. Yeah, 10%. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's. 12, you know, that'd be Nick Walker adding like 12 or 15 pounds of muscle from right now. That's, you know, that's a big difference on stage. Yeah. Especially when you use it smart, as you said, as you add the insulin to the diet, not the diet yeah. to the insulin yes, and the yes. extra I carbs. Wish, yeah. If there's one thing I could get across, I wish that's what people did. A, because, it, because it, the risk is much lower. You're not going to die because you're not, you're, you're building up slowly. You know, if we eat a hundred... 125 grams of carbs in whatever meal that we're going to have insulin. We know you can probably take 12 or 15 IUs, but we won't. We'll take like two, then the next week, three, then four. And we'll find, we'll track your blood sugar. And the minute you go, your blood sugar dips into the 70s, one hour after workout, we say, that's your dose. Stay there. And now we've 
the, the, now talk about like the we want to be as perfect as we, as we can that is perfect you know people surprise me because they count their you know macros they track their training their you know logbooks yeah. and so on but still they are too lazy to uh, to consider measuring the blood sugars yeah. or the blood glucose that yeah. it's it's just stupid because you're going to get yourself sick. Yeah, you were, oh, yeah, you do all these things. Yeah, the amount of time we spend injecting, measuring things, cooking, weighing out to do, there are two things, that and then the one thing that will save everyone, that pretty much anybody who has health issues has it because of blood pressure at some point. Yeah. You know, that's what's done. Get a blood pressure cuff. If you don't know how to take your blood pressure for like $29, you can get one on Amazon. Then yeah. once a month, while you're taking a shit, turn it on and see it. Okay, is my blood pressure good? If it's good, great. If it's high, it's not a death sentence. All that means is I need to get on telmasartan or I need to get on a lisinopril and get it back to normal. And then, I, then I'm fine because that's, that's what hurts us as bodybuilders. When we have the high and low days, where should we place them? Like, for example, do I place the high day before my priority port, body part? Or like in the day of training it that's a, a that's a really cool question because it's it depends are you trying to increase your performance or your progress because if you're trying to build muscle you want the high day on the day you're training that body part because then you have all those nutrients when the protein synthesis is going to occur but that doesn't optimize performance if you want to maximize performance you would have it the day before and so you got to think like well i'm a bodybuilder but i want to have a good workout it's like, well, how important is it to have the good workout? Is, is, is the workout important or is the results of the workout important? And a way to put it a different way that I think makes more sense is like if I were talking about, if I were going to go out for a run to try to burn fat, I wouldn't drink Gatorade. I wouldn't take those runner's gel packs. I wouldn't eat Cliff Bars because I'm trying to burn fat. You know, I'm, I'm running. But if I was running to try to win a competition, I would want all those things. And that's the same thing. If I so if I'm a power lifter or I, and I need to perform on a given day, the high day should go before that. But that means I'm not going to add as much muscle from that workout. I'll have a better workout, but I don't have all the nutrients to grow from it. If I want to actually grow the muscle, I'll have the high day on the day I'm training that body part, and then I'll maximize my growth because I have all the calories and all the nutrients to recover and grow from. But I might not have as good of a workout. And it, you're talking like a 1% difference, but it's, it's a hard concept to understand because you think like, I want a good workout. That's what's going to make me grow. And that's yes. But after that workout, the growth comes when you have the nutrients. And so you need the nutrients on that day. And which is more important in the off season, in the prep, I mean, because uh, I think it, are we keeping the performance or are we, we are not trying to build the muscle. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's all, no one's ever asked me that. No, because you aren't trying to build the muscle. So it, so what, what is the, then it takes on a different reasoning. Then we want it on a, not, not only a training day, but your hardest training day, not, not a body part you're trying to bring up, a, a body part where we burn the most calories, because then we know that we have the most, because remember, that's the day we're going to have our cheat meal also. That gives us the most leeway to, to you know, to, to not risk adding body fat, you know, because you think about it, you can do it mathematically, like say, say someone can store 500 grams of glycogen, or say, or actually say someone a large bodybuilder can store a thousand grams of glycogen and say, by the time we get to high day, their glycogen depleted, they're, they're, they're depleted 500 grams of it. Okay. So half their glycogen and let's say they're a big bodybuilder, obviously. So if they're eating 250 grams of protein, say they can eat 500 grams of carbs without getting fat. You know, that's, that's probably, you know, 3,500 calories. It's like, okay, that's what they can eat. So, so 250 grams of protein and 500 grams of carbs would be their baseline. If they're depleted 500 grams of carbs, we can add 500 grams more. Now we're eating a thousand grams of carbs and we aren't gaining any fat. We're storing all those extra, we're storing those calories still, but they're getting stored as glycogen rather than fat. And then now but we, we don't know those exact numbers. And so that's a lot of carbs. So we don't, so if we do that on a leg day where we burn a lot of calories, we can be pretty safe in assuming that, okay, we, we stored all that glycogen, we restored our metabolism and we probably didn't gain fat. If you do that on an off day, you have no, no leeway. You have no extra calorie burning to, you know, to help out. So yeah, no one's ever asked that. Yeah. But I think that's important because most of people struggle with it because where to place those days, you know, and it is hard. And as you, uh, you yourself saw the eBooks, I think it's worth explaining. Mm -hmm. yeah. Justin, thank you for your knowledge. Thank you for your time. And, uh, where can we find you? I have already shared the screen, but could you repeat? 
Yep, you can troponanutrition.com. It's uh, the, the worst name ever because it's hard to remember. But if you just search Justin Harris Nutrition, it'll come up. Uh, you can see me and my and the Team Troponin experts at teamtroponin.com, which is a, a much lower cost monthly subscription with hundreds of hours of footage, example diets, things like that. And then also, uh, well, you can't find me, but you can find my supplements at First Detachment, uh, you know, one, one D, firstdetachment.com. Okay. So, um, if you are new to the channel, please leave subscribe. And if you are already here, leave comment, like button, and visit the Troponin Nutrition. Thank you so much and speak to you later. Thank you.